Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here to give this presentation. The tree of life, it has millions of leaves. Each is a species about which we know a huge amounts of information. It has millions of branches, each telling a remarkable evolutionary story. Every one of us here is studying the tree of life one way or another. But what interests me is, can we see the tree of life? Can we visualise it? Well, why do we care about that? In the context of a workshop where we're trying to infer evolutionary paths from phylogenetic tree shape. Well, think of, for example, as an analogy, a game of chess. Computers play chess pretty well, and humans play chess pretty well too, at least some of them do, but in a different kind of way. And actually the optimum player of a game of chess is a human suggesting with intuition and human intelligence candidate moves, whilst the computer does the number crunching of just those candidate moves to see which ones work out the best. And in the same way, I think that human intuition can be used to look at empirical data, phylogenetic data, to, su to suggest patterns, to use our intuition. And then, after doing that, it becomes appropriate to run rigorous analysis to test what our intuition has seen. And then after the analysis, we also might want to do a sanity check on our results, and we wish to communicate them to each other, and hopefully also to the general public. And in order to do that, the stages both before and after the rigorous analysis, we need to be able to see the data, we need to be able to visualise it, to wrap our heads around it. And it's for that reason that I'm interested to present to you today a new way of visualising the tree of life. Well, I'm going to start a long time ago with one of the very first visualisations of the tree of life, and it's actually taken out of the context of evolution even a little. Uh, in, this is the work of Hitchcock, and he didn't envisage, as Darwin did, a single common ancestor for all life, but he did see, with this paleontological chart, that fossil evidence and species fell naturally into this tree shape, and it was a good way to depict the data. And it wasn't actually that long afterwards that Darwin, of course, published On the Origin of Species and uh, really pioneered this, this dramatic idea of one common ancestor for, for all of life. But what a fantastic uh, diagram, in just in his workbook there from years before, possibly one of the first drawings of what was actually a true evolutionary tree with the ideas of evolution running behind it. But a lot has changed since the time of Darwin. 150 years more, in fact, have passed since the publication of On the Origin of Species. And with that time, the scientific world and our knowledge has changed dramatically too. We've had a revolution in computing and in genetics, and that has changed everything <coughs> massively. This is the kind of thing we see now, a cladogram constructed using genetic data, and you can see here the names of all the species and some really nice pictures there, some additional information about them, including some extinct species there, which help tell us uh, stories about how different evolutionary links uh, took place in the past. But nice though this diagram is, there is a bit of a problem with it. As you may have noticed already from this workshop, there's been some fantastic talks showing beautiful data sets that have taken a huge deal of effort to create, but then when they put up on the screen like that, you can't read anything. It's just a great big long thing that is impressive, but you can't really see the data itself. And one way to get around that, or to start getting around that, is to just wrap it around in itself to produce these circular plots. That buys you a bit more space on the screen, but still you can only go so far. Some of the text is sideways. Uh, so what do you do then when you've got even more data and you're creating even more impressive data sets as people are now? Well, the most natural and sensible thing would be to buy yourself some more real estate on the screen with a system like this, <laughs> which is brilliant. But there's still a limit to it. You can still uh, only put so many species on the screen because you need to be able to read the text of the labels on the end at least. Even with NASA's Hyperwall, which has 128 displays, we're going to struggle tr to visualise trees like the bird tree, which people have already been talking about earlier during this workshop, soon to appear. So, how are we going to solve this problem? Well, 
Before I tell you that, I'm just going to mention the Open Tree of Life project, which is going to cause an even bigger explosion here, because they're going to be producing the complete Tree of Life with not just 10,000 species, not even hundreds of thousands of species, but approximately 2 million species. And how on earth are we going to be able to visualise that data, or are we just going to waste it? Um, well, it wouldn't be wasted, but it would be a great shame if we couldn't visualise it to appreciate it fully. And this really is the first challenge of tree visualisation. And you don't have to take my word for it that this is a challenge, because Rod Page, who studied this in great detail, was saying only very recently that visualising of large trees is a hard problem that has so far existed a solution. He goes on, we are still waiting for the equivalent of a Google Maps. And if that's a problem, how likely are we to achieve the dream of Hillis, who would like to see the complete tree of life on a small handheld device? That's just the first challenge, though. <coughs> Before I tell you about the other challenges, I'd like to talk a little bit more generally about how this challenge is actually part of a much bigger problem. And it's the problem of big data. Big data is actually a huge benefit to us. It's not just in phylogenetics, but in industry and other branches of science and in our personal lives, we're becoming overwhelmed with data. And this has happened very fast because it wasn't that long ago that we used the humble sheet of paper, the, the paper paradigm as I like to call it, to do our calculations, to store the information, to exchange the information, to visualise it. Everything was done with the sheet of paper. But now, in the last decade or so, we have huge data centres and everything is being revolutionised with the modern computing world. The paper paradigm in many respects is on its way out because we don't store information on this paper anymore, it's on the computer. <coughs> we don't create the information with paper anymore. Uh, it's that these vast phylogenies are only possible to make using modern fast computing equipment. And we visualise the information on screen too, but we don't visualise it strikingly in a way that takes full advantage of the interactive nature of a computer. We normally visualise things on screen in a way that we can print them any time and just get a piece of paper out as we used to. And that's a really big restriction on the way that you lay out information on the screen of a computer. And in order to be able to display these huge data sets that we're now creating, we need to go interactive and we need to lose this last aspect of the paper paradigm, the feeling that it needs to be put on screen in a way that we're going to print it the next moment. And one way of doing that is with these hyperbolic tree viewers, which have been around for some time. They use what's called a focus context type method, where you move the mouse around and that's the focus, and the part of the tree expands around where the mouse is and the rest of it contracts and gives you some context, like so. And this could even be extended to become 3D with this quite useful diagram. But this, for me, whilst it's beautiful and can visualise large trees, represents the second challenge I wanted to mention, which is the need for intuition in visualising the data. The reason why these haven't really caught on in a big way is because they're not very intuitive. You can't really see actually what the tree is here, although this is visualising a tree. The third challenge... I am going to introduce with this beautiful uh, painting by Clint, which was chosen, uh, I think, brilliantly uh, by Helen and, and Amuri, the organisers, to represent this workshop. And it is beautiful. And that is actually the third challenge, which is underestimated in visualising of trees and visualisation generally, is that it, it needs to be beautiful and engaging. Uh, like, for example, this poster, which seems to be up in most people's offices that I come across. It's a great visualisation of the tree of life, but only a very limited number of species. And it is beautiful. <coughs> but of course, this is no good for large trees that we're now creating. And it's, it's really, there's just very few leaves <coughs> on this tree, although it, it is really a, a work of art, in a sense, rather than uh, so much a scientific diagram. The fourth and final challenge I wanted to mention is that of metadata. Additional information that we want to label on the tree, other than the tree itself. And this is a tree of an old lizards, and many of them have these strikingly different dewlaps, 
We've already seen some nice photographs of them in earlier talks today. And that's an example of metadata, a characterization of these dewlaps, and that is indicated on the right with different colours. So that's kind of simple, but we may have multi-dimensional metadata to put on the tree. We may have maps, photographs that we want to put on the interior nodes as well as on the leaves of the tree. We may have photographs of fossils. You can go on and on. And actually that is a challenge to incorporate those into the tree in a nice way. So in the face of these four challenges, there's one problem that I want to tell you about to do with tree visualisation, and that is that we have too many choices. There's too many ways to do it. Here's a very simple example of a tree. There's spiders, insects. They're more closely related to each other than they are to the other groups, which are the reptile and the mammals. And what you can see is that if we switch some of these nodes around in certain ways, it's still representing the same information. That's still the same tree, even though I switched reptiles and mammals around. It's still telling us that reptiles are more closely related to mammals than they are to insects. And we can switch things around in many more ways. It's still the same story, even though um, that is a horrible visualisation of the tree. It's still, an accurate, it's still an accurate one. It still gives us the same information. And it's for this reason that there probably won't be one way to visualise a tree that everyone accepts this is the tree. There will be a number of different ways which use this freedom to uh, maximise different scientific and aesthetic properties to make them clear to us, the end users of the visualisation. So I'm now going to move on to present to you a new method of tree visualisation which I call OneZoom for reasons that will become very quickly obvious. I need to make a small adjustment to my computer first. Right, the resolution on this is fairly low. It looks like a tree, as you can see, but it's also like a map, in the sense that you can zoom in on areas of interest to get more information always, just as you might zoom in on uh, the map of Paris, and then you see the smaller areas, and eventually if you zoom in enough, you can see this building that we're in right now. So on this tree, I'm going to zoom in on the, the central mammals, and as I do that, we see more areas starting to come into focus and starting to appear to us. As we keep going, we're going to zoom into primates down there. We can see that primates, together with flying lemurs and tree shrews, form this group. And if I keep going, primates have now separated. We can see the different clades within primates. I'm going to rather predictably go in on the apes and show you where we ourselves are down here as humans. We're a green leaf there because we are the only least concerned species from a conservation perspective on this page. <laughs> And we can see that actually in more detail by zooming in, you can see further information, the Latin names, the common names, the relative status, and even a link to the Wikipedia page for these different species. But we also have space for further information on the interior nodes of the tree. So if we see here apes and humans, if I zoom in, we've now got the Latin name appearing as well, the period geological history where that diversification occurs, a pie chart indicating the red list conservation status of all of the ascending species. And as you can imagine, because of the way this is done with zooming, there's no reason why we shouldn't put as much information as we want anywhere we like on this tree. It would be very natural and easy to just zoom in and get to it. And the reason this is natural is because it's the way that we explore <coughs> the real world. We don't click on something in the real world and get zapped to a new place. It's continuous space. And if something interests you, you move closer to it and you see it in more detail because you've gone closer to it. And that's exactly how this works. I think another benefit of the zooming interface from a technical perspective is that if you have a small screen, it's not really a problem because you can just zoom in to see more information. If you have a large screen, then you're lucky and that's great because then you can take full advantage of it to see more information at the same time. If your process is slow, then you can minus on the detail and fewer of the details are seen and that really speeds up the rendering so that you can still explore the tree smoothly. Whereas if you've got a really fast super processor, then you can plus on the detail and get beautiful renderings and it will still remain smooth. So you don't need modern technology to use this, but if you happen to have it, then you can take full advantage of that. 
I'm now going to show you a couple of other features in this. Inside the view options, there are various other structures for visualising the same tree. Because remember I told you that there are several different ways to visualise the same tree. And this second way in particular I want to show you because it is indicating the balance of the tree. For example, this node down here, where the armadillos, anteaters and sloths branch off from this really large group containing most mammals, 4,600 species, you can see that that branch, you've got essentially a, a relatively thin branch coming off at a right angle from a main trunk that goes up. And that is deliberately there to indicate that most of the diversity is going on and a small part is coming off to one side. So it's immediately intuitively obvious. Whereas this node here, where you've got approximately equal diversity going to the left hand side, where you have bats, carnivoreans, ungulates, whales, brilliant stuff that side. The other side, you've also got rodents, rabbits, hares, primates, loads of things interesting on that side too. So you've got a, a Y-shaped branch with approximately equal diversity going to the left and to the right. And so wherever you explore on this, oh, something's happened. Wherever you explore on this, you've got an intuitive idea about the balance of the tree, which parts of it are unbalanced, which parts of it are balanced. I'm also going to show you this third visualisation, which doesn't show the balance so much, but in fact, not at all, but it is just another aesthetic way of visualising the tree. It works quite well with the labels and it makes good use of the space that you've got available. I'm now going to show you a couple of other features on this. I'm going to go back to the original view. This is a growth animation of the tree growing in scaled time. So that you get an idea of at what point in history you have sort of burst of diversification. And while that's going on, you can still explore it in the usual way. You can pause it and reverse it and do the usual things you might do with a video down there. Of course, you've got to bear in mind that the reason why it looks like it's coming off to a slow start is because there's probably lots of species there that have gone extinct and that aren't in the tree. But it would be nice in the future to get hold of a data set that contains loads of extinct species and include those to help show more evolutionary messages in this. I'm now going to demonstrate to you how capable this method is of visualising very large trees by showing you a 408,000 nose tree. This is bacteria, and it looks like a straight stick. That's because I've used the method, the view, where the balance is made really clear. And this is an incredibly unbalanced tree, with almost all the diversity in these tiny specks at the top there. But rather than browse through it by hand, I'm going to show one more feature of this, which is the search feature. So I put in the number corresponding to one of the leaves there, and I'm rather than jumping straight to the leaf where that, um, that species can be found, I'm going to fly it into the results. So that's now going to automatically zoom you in through the tree to show where that leaf is. And it gives you a perspective of just how huge a 408,000 node tree is. And I'll just remind you actually that the complete tree of life will be, have four times as many leaves as this. And it should also be labelled a lot better because there aren't many labels inside this tree. Uh, since all of the species are just numbers in the end. <laughs> I've just put this little bar up at the bottom to show you what size the original image would be if it was still there for us to be zoomed in this far. You can see it's already uh, more than a thousand kilometres across. By the time we get to the end, it will be much bigger still. In fact, in some parts of this, it's bigger than the observable universe. <laughs> <laughs> We're nearly at the end now of this particular uh, Zoom. And you can see as you get to the end, uh, the parts of the tree that are unbalanced and balanced. It's quite clear. So I'm now just going to go back to the original website and show you that if you press this home button, oh, oh dear, we're not connected to the internet. Well, never mind. Uh, if we went to the website locally instead,
So this is the, the, the one Zoom website, which you would have gone to had we been connected to the internet when I pressed that button. You can see for exploring the tree, there's also a demonstration video there. If you click on the software tab, I want to highlight that there is a place to load your own data if you've got it in your format. You follow the instructions there and probably within a minute of being on that site you would be looking at your, your own data in this tree. If you've got 100,000 nodes and that shouldn't be a problem, although with certain browsers it, it can be that the text box can't handle the copying and pasting of that amount of information, but certainly I've been able to visualise huge trees by uh, visualising them live in that way. What I hope is that also people will download the software using these links on the right. There is a version of it which runs just within a single standalone file. It doesn't need internet access, it doesn't need multiple files and folders, it's just one single file. You can open it in a text editor, you can copy and paste your new format tree into the top, save, and then it's fully allowed, it's all open source, you can redistribute that on your website and a supplementary material to your papers. And then any person click, can click on it in your website or click on it as supplementary material and they will be browsing your tree in exactly this way so that they can see this fantastic data set that you've created. You can also, of course, use any standard screen recording tool, such as ScreenR, for example, to uh, build a screencast of you exploring your tree that you can then embed into your talks if you don't want to do all this flipping over to move across to the software as I have done here. So, I'm now just going to go back to the presentation itself. First, small adjustment here. And I'm going to just conclude with a few words about how this is done. So, the actual title of the paper <coughs> in which I present this idea, together with Luke Harmon, is One Zoom, a fractal explorer for the <coughs> which already gives you a clue about the kind of maths and ideas that are behind this explorer. It actually only came out five, uh, sorry, seven days ago, about a week ago, this paper came out and the website went online then. And as you probably guessed, it has to do with fractals. And I'm going to start just by showing you an example of a fractal. This is a Luxembourg figure, and it's the branching pattern that you get from electrical discharge. You would have something like this if you were able to see lightning branching out to reach the ground. And in fact, I can't resist showing you this because someone uh, yesterday showed a picture of someone who had tattooed part of the tree onto their back. There is uh, an easier, though probably worse, way of doing this, which is to get struck by lightning, in which case you get a Luxembourg figure potentially burned into you. And it is a fractal. The, the, the reason you know that these Luxembourg figures are fractals is because if you zoom in on a small part of it, it looks the same as the whole. And the same is true in many living organisms, like, for example, this broccoli, actually that's probably a cauliflower, where you take away one of the florets and it looks almost identical to the whole, only smaller. And then you can take off one of the small pieces of that, and so the pattern goes on and on. And so this idea of self-similarity is what makes a fractal a fractal. The other property that I'll just mention briefly, because fractals are just so fascinating, is uh, that they have a dimension that isn't a whole number. So it might have a dimension between 2 and 3, for example. This is a, a diagram of the lungs down there, all the different airways in the lungs. And the surface area of the lungs, actually, if you were to study that mathematically, doesn't have quite a dimension of 2, like a flat surface would have, but it doesn't have a dimension of 3 either. It has something in between those two. And to demonstrate this, I'm going to take this piece of paper, which I don't like anyway, because I want to lose the paper paradigm, as you know. And you have to suspend your imagination and forget that it doesn't have a thickness because that, that does make this a slightly false uh, example. But imagine this doesn't have a thickness, it's now a flat sheet and with the lungs you need to, to cram as much surface area as possible into the smaller volume as possible. So I'm going to do that now. And I'm left with something with a lot of, of holes in it. It's, not, it's still the same piece of paper, it's not quite two dimensional, it's not quite three dimensional in a way. It's perhaps not a perfect analogy, but it gives some kind of an idea how you get left with something within a with a dimension of between two and three if you want to fit a large surface area into 
a small volume. So, why do these occur in nature? Because <coughs> similar processes occur in multiple scales, uh, like for example in the Luxembourg figure and also in river networks, because you need to create a complex organism with a simple set of rules coded into the DNA, and another example because you need to fit a large surface area into a small volume. I'm now going to show you what I think is quite a pretty example of a fractal created inside a computer, and it looks so strikingly like a leaf. And the thing that I find so brilliant about this is that you can make this figure with just 17 lines of code in R. You could practically send an old-fashioned text message containing the information you need to create this figure. And you can make them as big as you want and with as much detail as you want, just with that simple code. And this is one of the inspirations of one of the views that you've seen within the one zoom tree visualisation. But I'm going to go into just a little bit more detail about another view, which is the more spiral shaped one that I showed you initially. That begins with this very, very simple shape. And what you do is you take those two tips and each of them you replace with a smaller copy of the whole, like so. And then you repeat that process again and again. And eventually you get something that after essentially an infinite number of repeats or as many as you can do, you get a really beautiful picture. And that is exactly the process that uh, we use to produce this version of the tree. Of course, you then just have to label the information and recognise it for what it is, a branching pattern that could represent a phylogenetic tree. So what I envisage for this right now is, as I mentioned, that people will hopefully download it and use it to visualise their phylogenies in their talks. I also hope that this will become a useful educational tool in schools. But in the, the deeper future, I think it's possible that this method of visualisation of fractals with a zooming interface to create what I call interactive fractal-inspired graphs, or iFigs for short, these, they could be used to visualise other kinds of data, the contents of your computer, the contents of the internet, complex hierarchical industrial processes or financial data could, I think, potentially be visualised using the same kind of methods. But the application that starts to be most of all looking forward is the potential to make the equivalent of Google Maps for biology. <coughs> Westney said, just like Google Maps changed the way we look at geography, a sophisticated tree of life browser could really change the way we look at life all around us. And I really think that's true, and that's the most exciting application for me looking forward. Imagine being able to type in, for example, Darwin's finches and to get a dramatic fly through the tree, much better than the one I showed you there, where you zoom past the first examples of fishes crawling out of the ocean and all the write-up about how that occurred. You go fly past the Archaeopteryx with pictures of the fossils and all explanations of that. You get into the area where the pictures are and you see the radiation with pictures of all the beaks and the maps to show their ranges. But not just for the fishes, for all of life. And that could actually be done because people are collecting the data. There are huge databases um, forming on the internet, many of them. We just need a nice front end to make that happen. Also, what about amateur naturalists, twitchers? They, at the moment, commonly use identification books. But that's the paper paradigm again. I think that could become a thing of the past. They could be going in the future around with their smartphones and they could have the complete tree of all life in there with everything they need to know about it. You could even employ citizen science. They could press the button to say, I've just seen this. And because it's a smartphone, it knows where you've seen it and at what time. That gets recorded both for them and for the whole of science to use as a resource. So I actually think that in addition to the new emerging technologies like the genetic barcoding that has been talked about and remote sensing, that both of which are collecting huge amounts of data, citizen science can also be used to collect huge amounts of data and that will be a massive asset in the future. And the final uh, thing I want to say about this for the future is its potential for changing the way that evolution sceptics or people that are still making up their mind about it think about evolution because right now we can show a documentary or we can show a linear story of how one thing evolved from another or how two things share a common ancestor. But that's not really empowering them to explore. They'll just go somewhere else and say, well, what about this? How do you explain that? And eventually they'll find something you can't explain. But if this were implemented as I describe, then 
they would just see immediately <coughs> all the photographs, just how naturally everything falls into a tree shape before you even look at genetic information. And they would be able to zoom in on branches and say, oh, I wonder how this happened, that bats evolved to become flighty. And they would see pictures of fossils and information about that to, um, to, to read up about it. And they would find that wherever they went, there are explanations for evolution and there are interesting things to be seen. And I think that's potentially powerful, especially since it's, it's quite compelling to zoom into these fractals. Uh, that was, uh, in fact, where I got the idea from, just because I was fascinated zooming into these fractals on their own, but there was no information in them, they were just pretty pictures. <laughs> so that, for me, is, is the dream looking forward, the equivalent of Google Maps for biology. It could really be done, and I think this is the first glimpse of what it might look like with a great collaborative effort from the scientific community. Thank you.